In our last episode, we explored and cleared the Sierra Army Depot. After giving the news to Orville Wright, he and his family armed themselves with arms at the Sierra Army Depot so that they could stand up to the Salvatores. And for clearing the way for them, they made us a made man. We have now become a made man for three out of the four crime families of New Reno. And now, it's time to kill them. Reloading a previous save to before becoming a made man for any of the families, we can start by taking care of some unfinished business. In order to become a made man of the Mordino family, we have to kill Louis Salvatore, the head of the Salvatore family. Now, of course, one way to kill all of these families is just to go in guns blazing. An effective solution, but not the most subtle. By killing one of the bosses this way, we now have to fight our way back to the streets of New Reno, killing all of their goons along the way. So we'll focus on alternative ways to assassinate these crime bosses. Now we recall that Louis Salvatore is old and sickly. He sits in his room all day barking orders, breathing oxygen from an oxygen tank. But then we recall, during my video on Golgotha, we found a tank filled with poisoned gas in the basement of the Desperado. This immediately presents us with an idea. With a tank of poison gas in our inventory, we can head into Salvatore's bar and move upstairs. After Mason grants us access, we can use our sneak skill to sneak up behind Louis Salvatore and then steal from his inventory. In his inventory, we find an oxygen tank. Here, we can do a swap. We pass a steel check to take his oxygen tank and then another one to plant the poison tank. After making the swap, we can dash out quickly. Uh. <coughs> no, I hurt. Help. Please have mercy. I, I. Louis Salvatore drops dead. But if we kill him this way and stick around to watch him die, Mason puts two and two together. He figures out what we did and he attacks. So to kill him without Mason detecting, we can make the swap and then book it downstairs. After a while, if we come back, we find him lying dead on the ground. Poor Mr. Salvatore, says Mason. He was getting pretty old. Guess he finally breathed his last. I loved that wheezing old cripple. Now he's dead, and he'll never know how I felt. With Salvatore dead, we can loot his office. On his body, we find over 1,200 bucks and a couple of stim packs. In his desk, we find more stim packs, microfusion cells, money, a desert eagle, and 44 caliber ammunition. In one bookshelf, we find a shotgun and shotgun shells. In a footlocker on the ground, another stim pack, a first aid kit, more microfusion cells, another stack of nearly $800, and a laser pistol. In the next bookshelf, we find more money, a lighter, and a Dean's Book of Electronics. In the first bookshelf by his bed, we find a collection of booze. And in the final bookshelf, we find another stim pack, another first aid kit, and another oxygen tank. Another way to do this is by taking advantage of his weak heart. If we have a chem that alters stats, like a super stim pack or some buff out, we can use it on Louis Salvatore. If we wait or come back later, we find him dead. But the same thing happens. If he dies while we're upstairs, Mason and the Salvatore's turn hostile. So to get this to work, we've got to use the chem, hightail it out of there, let him die, then come back. With our assassination complete, we can head back to the Desperado and report our success to Big Jesus Mordino. A bead of sweat trickles down the side of Mordino's face. You have done as I asked? Luis Salvatore is dead? He's dead, we can say. Your family is avenged, Signor Mordino. So I have heard, he says, and he nods respectfully. You have done well. My faith in you was not misplaced. 
Here is your payment, 500 chips. Now at this point, if we haven't been completely respectful with Jesus Mordino this entire time, he tells us he has no work for us, and he informs us that we must now leave. But if we have a charisma of six or greater, and we were respectful with him at every opportunity, in addition to the 500 chips, he gives us some armor and a weapon. He nods. Your success pleases me. I would welcome you into the family, Mordino. And he clasps our shoulders. Will you join our family? Your strength shall be our strength. It would please me to become a member of family, Mordino, we can say. That is good. Do you have a name by which you wish to be called? All Mordinos, all Reno, shall know this name. And we again see the same list of names we can choose from when becoming a made man of any of the families. All right, and I don't want to get demonetized by YouTube, so let's see if we can pick something that doesn't have any other connotations. Um, how about Meat Cleaver? That's innocent enough, right? That is a good name. And he nods. The Mordino name has weight in New Reno. Visit the Cat's Paw, New Reno Arms, and tell them you are of my family. They will treat you well. Thank you, Signor Mordino, we can say. And with that, we become a made man of the Mordinos. Inspecting our inventory, we see that the armor he gave us was Leather Armor Mark II. We've outgrown that by now. And a Grease Gun, which is a pretty decent weapon. We talked about it in a previous episode. And, like becoming a made man with any of the families, we can visit the Cat's Paw to enjoy their services for free. And we can visit Eldritch at New Reno Arms to enjoy a discount and examine his special inventory. The jet dealers give us discounts, and all of New Reno treats us with respect. At this point, however, we can assassinate him. Like Luis Salvatore, Big Jesus Mordino has a weak heart. But unlike Salvatore, his guards are stupid. We can walk right into his room, give him a stimulant, like Buffhound, for example, and stand here and watch him die. Urg, Dios mio, my heart. And there he goes. He's dead. On his inventory, we find a combat leather jacket, a stim pack, a combat shotgun, shotgun shells, a tidy stash of caps, and a knife. But because he has guards in his room, we can't loot his other shelves without turning them hostile. However, there's an added benefit to killing Mordino the violent way and wiping out all of the thugs in the Desperado. If we kill him violently, and we kill his son, Little Jesus, on his body we find a unique weapon, a combat knife with a red handle named Little Jesus. This wicked looking blade once belonged to Little Jesus Mordino. It has numerous nicks and cuts along its surface, but its edge is razor sharp. On the handle is carved Little Jesus. It weighs two pounds. This weapon is not only the best combat knife in the game, but it's also the best one-handed melee weapon that doesn't take fusion cells in the game. It deals between five and 14 damage and only consumes three action points. It also has a weapon perk named Weapon Penetrate, and it's the only knife like this to have it. This weapon perk is found on other weapons like the Ripper and a number of pistols. The perk removes 80% of the target's DT, making it great for piercing through heavy armor. And since little Jesus Mordino has this weapon equipped, we can't pickpocket it off of him. We only get it by looting his dead body. So if we want this knife, the best way to take out the Mordinos is the violent method. With Mordino and his goons dead, we can now go back upstairs to Mordino's office to loot his containers. In one bookshelf, we find some mute fruit, Nuka-Cola, and a bunch of booze. After unlocking his desk, we find a revolver with ammunition, some frag grenades, stim packs, a small amount of cash, and a combat knife. In the other bookshelf, we find a shotgun with shotgun shells. And in his dresser, we find some Jimmy hats and a leather jacket. Next, there's John Bishop. 
We actually already explored all the ways to assassinate him in my series of videos on the Bishop family, and that's because his death was part of their questline. Weston from NCR gave us the quest to kill John Bishop. Now, John Bishop doesn't have a weak heart, so we can't kill him the way we can kill Salvatore or Mordino. There are only two ways to kill John Bishop without turning the entire Shark Club hostile. The first is to perform the Shady Sands Shuffle. After setting the timer on some dynamite, we can sneak up behind him and plant it on his inventory. Then, quickly going downstairs, we wait for the boom. If we waited upstairs, his thugs put two and two together, and they turn hostile. But by waiting downstairs, we can head back up, and no one knows what we did. The other way is to booby trap his safe. Now we learned from his wife that his safe is booby trapped with an explosive trap. If our repair skill is high enough, we can change the combination on his safe so that the next time he tries to access it, he triggers his own trap. After changing the combination, John will walk to his safe. So we need to head downstairs and wait. After a while, we hear the explosion and we find him lying dead by his safe. Killing John Bishop allows us to convince his wife to start a new life, which impacts the endings to Fallout 2. Endings which we'll tackle at the very end. Finally, there's Orville Wright. Now in my video on the Wright family, I pointed out his small children playing in the sand outside his house, but we quickly passed them by. They're running around saying, Arg, I've been hit. Bang, bang. Clearly playing. This time, we can talk with them. The child stops buzzing around and lifts up the pot to look at you. Why do you have a pot on your head, we can say. It's not a pot, stupid. It's my helmet, says the child. Whoa, sorry there, fearsome helmeted warrior, we can say. And he glares at us suspiciously. What do you want? What are you playing, we can ask. Metal insects and soldiers, he says. Metal insects, we can ask. Yeah, metal insects. We saw one when we were out in the desert. It was as big, and he takes a deep breath, as big as a house, and it had metal people in it. Really, we can say? Wow, where did you see it? In the desert. And he glances around and starts whispering. A bunch of us are going out there tonight. Wanna come? And he squints at us. But you gotta be really quiet, really quiet. I'll be quiet, we can say. Lead on, Macduff. This is a reference to Shakespeare, of all things. The original phrase was, lay on, Macduff, but over time, it evolved to lead on, Macduff. It comes from Shakespeare's Macbeth, Act 5, Scene 8. Lay on, Macduff, and damn be he who first cries, hold. <laughs> <laughs> This misquotation has been a part of English lexicon for a long time. It even appeared in H. Ryder Haggard's 1885 King Solomon's Mines. At any rate, if we tell him to lead on, we wait until it gets dark, then we follow the kids into the desert. And we arrive to watch the arms exchange going on between the Salvatores and this enclave. The only other way to see this scene is to side with the Salvatores and become a made man for them. If we do, we arrive at this scene as one of the Salvatores' guards. But here, we are hiding behind a bunch of crates. And strangely enough, the kids are nowhere to be seen. However, this scene plays out exactly the same way. If we choose to leave our concealment, they will attack. But even if we're victorious, we don't get much for killing them. The Enclave soldiers just carry Panker jackhammers, grenades, and shotgun shells. In the morning, we can head back to the Wright family and again talk to the kids outside. If we have a lower level pistol in our inventory, like a 10 millimeter pistol, this time when we ask him what game they're playing, the child says, can I play with your gun? Now we find a number of options to tell him no, including you'll shoot your eye out. A reference to a Christmas story. You shoot your eye out? <sighs> My mother must have gotten to Miss Shields. There could be no other explanation. You'll shoot your eye out! You'll shoot your eye out! <laughs> or we can say, 
Why, sure you can, you little pothead. Here you go. And we give him an unloaded pistol. We take the crappiest gun from our pack and give it to the kid. He smiles and holds it up, admiring it. My gun! Cool! I know where I can get some ammo for it, too! At this point, we can walk away and hope for the best, or we can set a devious plan in motion. Lock and load, kid, we can say. Say, why don't you go show your gun to your daddy? Be sure to wave it around a lot and pull that little switch beneath the gun there. Okay, says the child, and he runs off. If we follow the child back into Wright Mansion, the rest of his children turn hostile. Apparently, they see the kid running around with a loaded pistol, and they put two and two together. So if we want to do this without getting caught, as soon as we tell the kid to go show the gun to his dad, we can say, Well, this little act of evil might take a while to bear fruit. Better leave the area and come back. The kid runs off, and we hightail it out of this side of town. Then, coming back, we see that the kids are no longer playing outside. The guards outside don't appear to be aware of what we've done, but heading inside, we find Orville Wright lying dead in his study. On his body is a shotgun, some shotgun shells, booze, a lighter, a small amount of money, and some stim packs. And on the ground next to him is our 10 millimeter pistol, the one we gave to his kid. With Orville dead, we can loot his office, in one bookshelf, we find a fuzzy velvet Elvis, nice, and some money. In the next bookshelf, shotgun shells and a stim pack, and in the final one, a hunting rifle and some ammunition. But no one here really appears to realize that Orville is dead. His sons don't react, and neither does his wife. With that, we've explored how to become a made man with every crime boss, and how to assassinate them all quietly. Let me tell you what I chose to do. I chose to kill the Mordinos, the Salvatores, and the Bishops violently. I didn't want to miss out on all of the experience we get for doing so. We level up, our companions level up, and we walk away with a ton of weapons, money, and ammunition. I turned the back room of the Shark Club into my personal armory spending a great deal of time organizing all of my weapons, armor, ammunition, and chems into bookshelves. Then I became a made man for the Wright family. They appeared to be the less evil of the families here in New Reno, and a booze still just didn't seem to be a big enough reason to get rid of them all. With that, we've completed New Reno. Every quest, every family, every character spoken to. And while here, we learned some disturbing information about the NCR. They were working with at least one crime family in New Reno to try and take over nearby cities. Were they working with others? What is the extent of their activities in the wasteland? To find out, we need to head to NCR. We'll pick up with the story when we arrive at NCR in my next episode. I publish many videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a brand new shirt in the shop. I've been to Project Purity. Confound your friends and family who recognize the Jefferson Memorial, but have no idea what Project Purity is. This design comes on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.